Oh, good thing. Good thing, Kelsey. <laughs> I muted. Good morning. <laughs> Happy Saturday. Um, we're going to get started. So we're going to do a kind of something new and different in this call. Um, I've been trying to mastermind a lot more lately. So we're going to do that a little bit in this call, which is always super helpful. Um, so we're going to kind of do this call in two parts. The first half, we're going to work on some vision work. And then the second half, we're going to work on conversations. So if you struggle knowing what words to use, if you get hung up in your invite process, if you run into obstacles you don't know how to overcome during conversations, um, if you aren't feeling like you're coming across authentically or being able to share sort of your vision or your story the right way, like this is really what I want to focus on. I think as newer coaches, which my calls are a little more geared towards this quarter, um, this is important stuff, but it's not rocket science. It's not, it's, it's just the beginning and it's your time to start practicing. So, um, I'm going to run you guys through a vision, uh, just a, a little vision work. This is something that Trina um, posted the other day in our um, network chat. And I was like, oh, this is amazing. I have to try and do this on a power hour. So it's a little different than what we normally do. Again, I don't have any visuals today. Um, we're just going to talk, which is okay. Um, but I want you guys to be active in the chat. I want you to, when I say post it in the chat, I really want you to take the time to try and do it because it's really a powerful thing. Um, when you can see what other coaches in your position are doing, I struggle sometimes when coaches who've been doing this for a long time, like I have, and they say, when I started, or when I was in the beginning of my journey, it feels very distant to me now, but at the same time, it's still so close to my heart. But I know at the end of the day, you guys care about your stories more than anyone else's. And that's what I want you to care about most. I want you to have some, I want you to think about your story and where you're at. Um, and if you can see little pieces of yourself within stories that other people share, amazing. That's really what helps you develop your own and really find your voice in your story. But what I wanted to share today, and as I kind of go through this, I want you guys to take a few minutes and I want you to detail your own vision for your life, your business in the chat as I kind of talk. When I um, started coaching, my vision felt very different than what everyone was telling me it should look like. <laughs> um, I remember thinking that everyone's got like this really like big thing. Like I want to build a house on a lake. They had like very specific, I want to buy this car or I want to be able to do this thing. And I felt like my number two driving factors like the entire reason that I got involved in any of this to begin with was a I wanted to become a better person I wanted to become somebody who had a positive impact and influence on other people and that was largely driven by being in a long-term depressive kind of state I was a new mom and I was seeing myself really through his eyes for the first time. And any of you guys that have children, I'm sure you've experienced this in some kind of way where you look at your kid and you're like, I got to fix this stuff. <laughs> like, this isn't going to work. <laughs> and, I was, and I was like, oh, this isn't natural for me to be a mother. I've got to figure like something else is going on. And so I, I really had to have this come to Jesus moment, if you will, for a minute. And I really wanted to become someone better. That was, I would say, hands down, the thing that got me through every single failure, pit stop, everything. Because at the end of the day, my whole purpose wasn't to stay where I was, right? And so when I would hit these roadblocks, when people would tell me no, I, it's almost like I rebelled against that. Like I started to rebel against this old self. And it was so powerful to actually be able to practice that every day, to like be faced with these little obstacles that were coming up and 
defy it and be like, no, I'm the old me would have done this. The me I'm trying to become is going to handle this this way. And that's how I made every single decision the day that I became a coach, the day I signed up and started P90X for the first time. So I would say it was even from the time I hit the buy button on the infomercial that I was like, no more, this is done. That old me is gone. And I really stayed focused on that person that I was ultimately trying to become. So number one, that was like my dream. That was my vision. I envisioned myself being someone different than what I was at that moment. The second thing um, that's taken me a really long time to put into words that really drove me. And again, I want you guys to detail sort of your vision in your chat. I want you to think about why you're here and what you're actually working on and what your deepest driver is. That's the thing that like you think about every day when you want to give up and you don't. What's that? What keeps you from that? Um, and I want you to post it in the chat as I talk. Um, but the second thing for me was be productive. I wanted to be productive with my time. I felt like I wasn't doing anything of value. I wanted to contribute. I wanted to do something bigger than myself. Um, I wanted to help other people. And I wanted to be productive with my time because at that time, I felt like I was wasting a lot of it. And any of you guys that have dealt with anxiety or depression, that's something that um, I think you, I think is like a chronic symptom of that is where you never feel productive. You feel like your contribution is nothing, right? And so that was a huge driver for me. There were definitely more tangible things. Um, I would say getting off food stamps was a really big one for me. Um, we were in six figure debt at that time. And I'm just going to say this because we're talking about finances. Team Beachbody does not guarantee any level of success or income from the Team Beachbody coach opportunity. Each coach income depends on his or her own efforts, diligence, skill, see our statement of independent coach earnings for the most recent information if you need to. But um, I was six figures in debt. We were on food stamps. That was a really difficult thing for me. As someone who is very independent, um, my husband was in grad school, so he was gone 60, 70 plus hours a week, and he was doing an international MBA, so he was also out of the country a lot. Um, so I was alone with my brand new one-year-old child that I was like trying to figure out how to <laughs> be a parent, right? So I had all these things going on, and on top of that, piled in debt. And then, um, so one of my big driving factors was to get off food stamps. My second one was to pay off that six figure debt. That's what I wanted to do with Beachbody. That's why I was motivated to make money and not just help people, right? Um, I wanted, and then here were my fun goals. I did have a couple of fun goals. <laughs> my, my, my first real ah, goal was I want to make a million dollars coaching. I want to see if I can make a million dollars doing something. And at the time, that goal was rooted in not ever feeling like I was enough. I grew up in a, in a home where a highly educated home. Both my parents have bachelor degrees or higher. Um, one of my sisters has a PhD. My other brother has a master. Actually, so three of my siblings have masters. One has a PhD. Both my parents are highly educated, right? And I was like, I want to go to hair school. <laughs> I want to do like art. I want to create. I want to help people. And it was like this whole thing, my whole life of like not being in that box. You know what I mean? So for me, it was, I think, again, a rebellion of I don't have to be educated in order to do something incredible with my life. I'm smart. I'm talented. I'm good enough. And that's really where that came from. Like I had to prove myself in a big way. So that was a really big driver for me. I wanted to prove that I had worth. And that's where that goal came from. And then my last one was, um, 
I wanted to, I don't want to say retire my husband because I think that's really dangerous territory. <laughs> that's not something that I wanted to do, but I did want to provide a financially stable environment where my husband could follow his dreams. He could quit corporate and chase whatever he wanted to. He grew up extremely poor, very underprivileged, really hard background. And he's just the most incredible person. And I just was like, I want to be the one in your life that gives back to you, like that gives you something, you know? And so those were my really deep drivers. And it, you know, isn't anything fantastical. It's not like I had this huge, you know, rags to riches or crazy kind of story. It was pretty normal stuff. But to me, it felt big and it felt scary. And at the time, like, again, you guys have to remember, like in the beginning, coming into coaching, I was so affected by my shyness, by my depression, by my anxiety, social anxiety that like, and I tell people this all the time that I was, I was the type of person that if I got a fly in my water in a restaurant, like if it came with like something gross in it, I would have just picked it out and drank it anyway, instead of asking the waitress to like, take it back. Cause I was like that, like that afraid of everything. Like I was that afraid. I remember my coach trying to get me on a call for the first time to talk about my vision, to talk about goals. It took him I don't know, three weeks just to get me on a phone call because and not because I didn't want to, but because I was like, <gasps> I can't, like, I don't want to talk to somebody else that I don't know. Like, this is so weird. And I'm just telling you from the person that I was back then, who was the only person, by the way, that could have got me to where I am um, to now, it's like night and day, night and day. I drove every day to become that person that I ultimately wanted to become. So what I want you to do, and I, I love that you guys are writing this out. I want you to take a minute, if you guys can, and just go through and read these because it's just amazing. It's amazing to really see people who have a very clear vision of what they want. And it doesn't have to be anything, again, fantastical. It can be like, I want to be able to pay my $15 a month Netflix feed so I can have fun. Like it doesn't have to be anything crazy. Um, but if it is crazy, that's okay too. Um, Nat said, I need to feel unstuck in life, stuck because of time, stuck because of finances, stuck because of mindset, finding true bliss and living life and to leave a legacy for my family who comes after me. I love that. That is a super strong vision. It's simple. It's easy to remember. You don't have to think about it, right? Like it's just in you. That's the one thing that I, that I think is so important is your vision is something that's part of you. It's already in you. I think where we get kind of messed up is when we start comparing it to other people's and when it doesn't look the same, we think it's not worthy. And then we delude ourselves that it's not what we really want or really deserve, right? If somebody came to me and said, Jace, how did you make a million dollars coaching? And I said, I just wanted to be more productive with my time. That's not sexy. <laughs> it's not fantastical, right? But that is something that meant so much to me. I don't want to waste my life. I want to do something with it, right? That is fantastical. Like that does sound a little bit more like, okay, that makes sense. You know what I mean? It took me a long time to really find the words to project that vision outward. And so if you don't really know how to put your drive into words, it's okay. As long as it's in there, that's what matters the most, right? I know that they say like, put it out in the universe and speak it. You can speak it through your energy. You can speak it through your daily activity and your commitment to yourself. You can speak it through a lot of different ways. So don't get too hung up on what everybody else's looks like. 
Tanya said, I'm here to build wealth for myself, my kids, my future grand and great grandkids. I'm here to build total freedom, personal, financial, and time. I'm here to build a community around me of kick-ass people who keep the vibe high and the ambition higher. Jennifer said, I want to have enough money and time to work on my art career. I love that. I want to have an art studio and help people live into their true potential. I love that. I think, I think something that's so important, you guys, with coaching, because sometimes it can feel repetitive and like, all we're here to do is sponsor. All anybody cares about is inviting. All anybody, whatever, right? If you have a goal like that, if you have a vision like that, where you're using Beachbody as a vehicle, right? And you're using Beachbody as a mean to an end to help you reach your ultimate vision in life. Awesome. That's such a healthy way to approach this business. If you're looking at this business as a way to define your worth and who you are, not a healthy way. Not a healthy way you'll lose, right? If you don't hit that rank and you feel like a piece of crap, that's what you're doing. You're putting your worth into your accomplishments. And that's an that's a area of personal work you can start with, right? That's when you have to say, okay, how do I feel worthy? Where do I feel my worth is coming from? Is it external or is it internal? And that's just a real mindset shift that you can make right and that helps you dive deeper into that vision um kylie said mine isn't necessarily financial because the money is nice but i just truly want to build a community of people who want to get healthy in all aspects of their life i love that it doesn't also have to be financial you know what i mean i think that i think that there are definitely like for me, I wanted to become a better person. I wanted to be more productive with my time. And I wanted to do that by serving other people. Like to me, if I was going to build wealth, if I was going to do any of this stuff, if I was going to dig myself out of this hole, it felt right to do that by helping someone else. I wanted to, again, have a positive influence and impact on other people. Because for me, I wanted to be that for my son, right? I wanted him, I think at the time I remember saying to myself, like, he cannot grow up thinking this is what women are like. That's how I felt about myself. Like I had this urgent need to fix it. And I think, you know, that's a really powerful driver. But I think when you look at your life and your situation, it doesn't have to be that deep. It can be like, you know what? I don't have enough outlets to have fun. I don't have a group of people that get me, that love me. That's what I want. Like, I just want to be in a better, more positive, healthy environment. These things, you guys, as long as they drive you deeply, are all you need. That's it. Um, Ivana said, I love seeing people get it, seeing the light bulb go off and then feeling empowered to take control of their health, fitness, and mindset. I love being surrounded by the positivity and energy of the support of women in my community. I love that. Like that is enough, right? I mean, that's enough. What else do we need? Like, I think that this is a hard lesson that I learned coming from an overachieving family, right? Um, and by overachieving, I mean like my brother built and sold a company for $300 million, like overachievers, <laughs> you know? Um, I think coming from that environment, in order to be worthy and to stand up in that environment that I was in, came at a great cost to my own personal definition of worthiness. Think about that. Are you driving with your vision towards a person you're ultimately trying to become who is, um, are you really seeking that worthy route, right? I think that's really key. So what I wanna do really quick now that we've kind of detailed that, is I want you to think about your vision and I want you to understand that there's about a five-year gap 
between you and that vision. I think people don't quite understand that that's what it takes. But when you understand that, it helps you calm down a little and be a little more intentional with the steps you're taking towards it. There's a five-year gap between you and that vision. So it's really important. And what I want to do right now, and you can post your goal in the chat, is to set a smaller goal that you can set between now and then. What's that goal? What's going to get you there? Right? If your vision is five years from now, what smaller goals can you set that are going to keep you on track towards it? Right? Again, my goal, my, my vision was to make a million dollars coaching. That was like my fun, big goal. But it was also to pay off a six figure debt, which was a really hard goal. <laughs> right? So income was necessary for me. So what I had to do was look at the compensation plan and I had to focus on what was going to help me earn income. And what led down that road was how many people can I impact in this process? How many people will I impact in this process? And it excited me. It was exciting. Um, so my first goal um, was to build my challenge group and get 100 challengers. That was my goal. Um, my next goal was to go diamond. My next goal was to hit star diamond and then go success club legend and then million club. Like that's the route that I took in order to achieve my vision. Using Beachbody as my vehicle and my mean to an end to get there, right? Um, so what, what is that goal for you? I want you guys to take a minute and I just want you to set that and I want you to post it in the chat. I'm going to give you two minutes. Okay, and next I want you guys to think about this. When you think about your vision, what are the greatest obstacles that are keeping you from that vision? What obstacles are you facing? Write them down, put them in the chat. I think it's really easy to look at people who have been successful with coaching specifically, because we're in such an environment of share, 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 that so many of the victories get shared, but like, it's the little tiny moments where you have to work through them on your own that don't get talked about a lot. Right. Um, yeah. My biggest obstacle is fear. Biggest obstacle is growing my challenge group. Um, or maybe that's your goal. Um, two, two things that I've noticed, and we're just going to talk about this for five minutes and then move on to this next part of it, are distraction and discouragement. I would say those two things can categorize almost every obstacle that we face. Distraction, discouragement. So if you can sit down, and you can write this down and say, how am I going to deal with distraction? How am I going to deal with discouragement? It's going to help you because when those two things come up, not only are you going to be able to identify them, oh, I'm distracted right now. Oh, I'm feeling discouraged right now. You're going to have a plan in your mind already on how to deal with that. Success is just setting yourself up for it. It's like meal prep. Why do we do that? We do it because we know we're going to fail. 
right? <laughs> so we prepare so that we won't. Your business is the same thing. You just have to do it mentally. It's a mental preparation instead of a physical one. It's a, what am I going to do when I face rejection? How am I going to manage conflict? How am I going to deal with distraction? How am I going to overcome discouragement? You have to have a plan in place for those things right? Otherwise, what ends up happening is inconsistency. Loss of results. Lack of vision, right? All the things we don't want. So here's a couple of things with distraction. I'm just going to give you a couple ideas and discouragement. For distraction, there's a few things. There's big distractions like life happening, and then there's small distractions. Um, so really figuring out which one you deal with more, I think is important. Is life distracting you or is it just the little things? Um, but I think putting your phone on airplane mode is a really smart move. It's real simple, but when you sit down to do your power hours, when you sit down to play with your kids, when you sit down to do something important that you need to focus on, put your phone on airplane mode. Like, don't let those little things distract you because you may not think that a text coming through is going to be a big deal. It's a big deal. It's a big deal when you're in your flow and you're moving, and you're running and somebody's like, Aah! like it throws everything off. We don't have time. For that. We got too much going on. Right. Um, I think minimizing multitasking. I realize this is a big ask for women because that's what I feel like we always are doing but that is one of the fastest ways to burn out is multitasking too much I, instead of multitasking try to work in pockets i'm going to do laundry for 15 minutes and i'm just going to do laundry i'm going to do the dishes for 15 minutes and i'm just going to do the dishes i'm going to do my power hour and i'm only going to think about beach body that's it like it's hard. It's a muscle that you have to train your brain. You have to literally teach yourself to not multitask because that's literally what we've all been raised to do. <laughs> you know what I mean? You have to like really allow yourself to get singular. Otherwise there's no quality in anything that you're doing and your brain's going to go nuts, right? If you are a mom and you've got little kids, especially get a freaking babysitter. This is something that was so hard for me. I didn't live near family or friends. I didn't, I didn't have that option. So what did I do? I looked for, in Nashville, when I started coaching, there was a daycare that would take your kids for an hour at a time. So you could go grocery shopping and then like pick up your kids. It was like a little play center. It was like $12 an hour, which was ridiculous at the time. I thought that was so expensive. But the first time that I did it, he had so much fun. It was only one hour. I got so much done. And that $12 quickly became the most worth money I spent ever. Just to give myself a singular moment of time where I could work. That's it. Like there, there is no <laughs> replacement for that kind of focus, being able to just, because then you get all your stuff done and you're present for the rest of the day. Worth it, right? Um, okay, minimize multitasking, a steady routine. You guys already know how much a routine helps, right? Um, I think one thing that people struggle with is scheduling your time. I think as I think as humans, that's just a thing that we're constantly going to deal with our whole life, but scheduling your time. And I would say not even scheduling it out perfectly. If you've got a three item to do list, just schedule out when you're going to do those three things and let the rest of your day flow. That, I mean, that will help you a lot. Um, and then sleep. That's like number one, sleep. If you ask any person who has built any kind of successful career, any kind of anything, what they prioritize always is rest. Always. Otherwise, you burn out and you're ineffective. 
anything that makes you less effective is something that you need to work on. If that's your diet, if that's your sleep patterns, if that's what you're ingesting into your mindset every day, fix it. Like you got to work on it. It doesn't have to be perfect. It never will be. But if you can be intentional about social media is really distracting me. I'm just going to put my phone on airplane mode for an hour, or I'm going to infuse a one hour, no phone zone a day for myself, no matter what. And you can start with 10 minute increments. If that's too much for you, if that's too much for you. That's when you're like, I really have a problem. <laughs> I really got to cut this back. Right. But take your phone away for 10 minutes, then 20 minutes, then 30 minutes, then 40 minutes, then 50 minutes. Do you see what I'm saying? And like, really try to discipline yourself in that way. And I promise you guys, the more you discipline yourself, the easier coaching becomes. Because not only do you have more discipline, now you know how to teach people how to discipline themselves. And that's all they're trying to do is learn how to discipline. Successful people are just disciplined people. They're not perfectly organized, right? They don't have perfect lives. They don't have no distractions. They have literally every single thing that you have going on. They've just learned how to cope and manage with it in healthier ways that keeps them moving forward, right? So between you and your five-year vision, set some goals in between that are gonna keep you motivated and moving towards that, okay? We're gonna switch gears. And we're going to go to this next part. So some of my um, girls expressed this week that, they're, that they struggle a little bit um, in conversation. I think having your vision really strong in your mind helps you have conversations better with people because you realize I'm just helping them try to clarify their vision. Like their vision is theirs and that's their responsibility. I'm just trying to help them facilitate and feel like it's approachable and that they can achieve it. Right. Um, and so I think that that's really important. Um, so we're going to talk about how to become a little bit more effective communicators. Where do you guys find yourselves getting hung up in conversations? I want you to post them in the chat. If there's like something that's like a wall or you find like obstacles you're having a hard time overcoming like where are you getting hung up in the conversation is it your confidence level where you're just going into the conversation like um you know scared like where are you struggling with your conversations and inviting process um how to bring up speaking about this lifestyle. I don't think that's odd. I think just really defining what that lifestyle is, like sit down and write it out. Like what lifestyle are you talking about? Exercising every day, like eating healthy. I think that's really more of a trying to align your idea of this lifestyle you're trying to communicate and being confident in that. A lot of the times, like, when you're afraid to bring something up, think about this. If you're afraid to bring something up, where, why, why? Just ask yourself why. Why are you afraid to bring something up? And then once you write that down, I want you to say, why? Okay, the social awkwardness, I 100% understand. <laughs> But can I tell you guys, there are a lot of awkward top coaches, a lot. <laughs> but can I tell you something? Most people who thrive in this kind of environment and business are awkward. They're a little weird. You know why? Because they look at life differently. They approach life in a different perspective than everyone else. They it, it's funny because the social awkwardness, like I told you a hundred percent, I have social anxiety. So I get that. That part of it is really just connecting with yourself. 
a lot of people who have social awkward or feel awkward around other people are usually having some kind of outer body experience where they're not connected to themselves and so they can't be present. So one thing I will say is try to be more present in your approach. If that takes you five minutes to like really get in the moment before you make a post, before you talk to someone else, do it. Like it's just really identifying that part of it. Um, I was at the connection part, I'm inviting new people and commenting on their stuff or messaging them from their stories. And I never know how to transition that to the invite. That's something that I feel like I'm actually, that's something that I feel like is more of a um, confidence thing. I think if they're, if you're, if you're connecting and you're messaging people and you're networking and your page exemplifies what you are and what you do, then you acting as a coach is going to be assumed. You know what I'm saying? But if you don't post about Beachbody, if you don't post about coaching, if you don't post about nutrition, if you aren't posting anything in that realm, you don't have the right to talk to people about that stuff. And so you won't, right? You have to have that credibility to back that up. So if you go to your social media page and you're playing it safe, and you're never talking about anything that you're doing, again, ask yourself, why am I afraid to talk about this? Where's that stemming from? And then two, like, you have to start establishing some credibility that way. And by credibility, I mean consistency in living this lifestyle, sharing the lifestyle that you're living and really understanding the lifestyle that you're living. I think even if you just share that journey of trying to understand what healthy living means to you, and that's what your page is about, you're going to have all the permission in the world to talk about anything you want with anyone, right? Um, there's always ways that you can bring the conversation into on topic. I think one thing that's really important is it's hard to transition conversations that are not on topic. So really, when you do your networking, when you do your marketing, when you do your posting, when you do your inviting, you want to make everything on topic, right? So if you're commenting on somebody, somebody's post and their family is like so cute and you're like trying to connect with them, your family looks so healthy. You guys look so happy immediately. It's on topic, right? Because who says your family looks healthy? No one. Like immediately that's like, that's a weird comment, but I'm going to pay attention to it. And it might start a conversation, right? You can even say like, your family looks so healthy. What do you guys do to stay active? What do you guys do to stay connected to each other? It's your job to stay on topic, right? Because you're bringing the topic to the table. Does that make sense? So when you're making your comments, when you're liking people's stuff, you got to make sure that these are people that need this and who doesn't need this? Everybody, right? So look for things that you can comment on, on topic, and it will help you transition those conversations better. And then make sure that your landing page or the place that people are going to go to figure out who you are is also on topic. Right? The, those two things being aligned, I'm telling you guys will change everything. If they're not, it will hurt everything. It doesn't make sense, right? It's like me going out and talking about, I don't even know, dermatology or something. And then people coming to my page and I'm like a fitness coach. <laughs> it's like, it doesn't make any sense, right? Okay. Um, Cheryl said, beginning new friendships online seems odd from a person that loves to speak so much more since losing 190 pounds. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. I should have had, I should have a handle on it. And I feel like I'm drowning and the words just get jumbled. One thing that I will say, like when you approach social media as like a stranger platform, 
generally speaking, I actually think that's where healthy people drive <laughs> is from like a more cautious, like, oh, these are people I don't know. For me, when I started coaching, I didn't have any boundaries. So I was like, everyone's safe. Everyone's like me. Everyone's nice and happy and wants people to succeed. Most people don't approach life that way. That's how I was approaching life. Um, so I think that's actually healthy. But I think one thing to just remember, it's like, how you, how you behave and how you react is who you attract. So if you're a genuine, authentic person, you're probably going to attract genuine, authentic people. If you're energetic and fun and lively, you're probably going to attract, attract like lively, energetic people. If you have toxic traits yourself, toxic beliefs yourself, you are going to attract toxic people. One thing that I love teaching, because I think so many people look outward and say like, oh, I stay away from toxic people. And you know what toxic people look like, but have you ever asked yourself, what are my toxic traits? How am I being toxic? Right? If you're not being confident in who you are and how you're living, that's toxic to you, to other people, that's like the most obvious, but not obvious one. So when you go to connect with people online, it's so important to show up as your most authentic self, right? And really remove the, that fear and that toxicity and just really try to be open. That's like the main thing that I could say is just trying to be open. Like you're not there to please people. We're not here to please people. We're here to help people change their lives. It's, you know, just really show up with that purpose in mind. Um, the obstacle of saying they don't have time or money, et cetera, cost. Money is always where I get hung up and digging deeper into pain points and what's going on. So I actually wrote this down because I know this is such a huge thing. Um, I have a formula that I created um, through practice and making a lot of mistakes with my conversations that I follow in the invite process and digging deeper. I try to work out everything before cost is even in discussion. I hardly ever tell people what things cost ever. Like I, in nine years coaching, I've never been like, I, I, except for maybe for, exception of the first six months when I was learning how to do this. Um, it's just not an issue for me because I don't focus the energy in that direction. The, the energy in the direction that I focus on is the change, the shift, the transformation, where that person's been up to this point, where they are right now, and how we are going to move forward together to get them to where they want to go. And it may seem really obvious, but that's my formula. If I don't have those three pieces of information, I don't offer a solution, right? I also have my challenger from the instant someone starts talking to me, I treat them like my challenger, whether they are or not, whether they buy or not, I'm coaching them in that moment from the get-go. I look at my invite process as a consultation. They're coming to me. They're looking for advice. They need something. I'm not the expert, but I'm definitely the person that has the solution and the information that can give it to them. That's what a consultation is for, right? The consultation is, hey, I'm needing this. And you being like, oh, that's a service that I provide. Here's all the information. And then being like, okay, let me think about this. And being like, does this sound like something that you would want. Here's your plan based on the problems that you're like, think about it from like, a, let's use dermatology. I'm having a breakout. My skin's freaking out. Where do you go to a dermatologist? You sit down in their office, you pay them for the visit, right? But you sit down, you have a consultation, you go through all the problems that you're having, all the things that you're facing. The doctor then prescribes what a plan that they think is best, right? Do they talk to you about how much stuff is co costs? 
Has any doctor ever been like, this visit's going to be $300 and then this plan's going to be $1,000 without even telling you what the plan is? First, no. They tell you the plan. They sell you on the solution. They make sure that you're confident and comfortable with the solution and that it's approachable for you. And then they talk about the affordability of it because that's last, right? You first, that last. I think the, the, the money part of it is so interesting, but I do have some really good tips for you as far as I can't afford it. So when someone says, I can't afford this, or this is too expensive, the first response, one of my favorite responses that I used to use all the time was, which part? That's all I would respond. I can't afford this. And I would be like, which part? Question mark. It makes them think, right? And if they're like the challenge pack part, and I was like, can you afford to continue living the way that you're living? And if they're like, but I really financially can't afford this, then I say, let's talk about that, right? Like you cannot be afraid to dig deeper. Your job is to help people invest in themselves. So if they're not willing to invest in themselves, there's a reason. Most of the time they can afford it. They've just never spent money like that on themselves where A, it worked, or B, they've never actually spent money on their health in that way ever before. How many of you guys felt like it was a frivolous spend when you bought Shakeology for the first time? I did. Six figures in debt, food stamps. Remember, for my coach to be like, come buy this $130 bag of Shakeology, you better believe I had to have some serious belief in what I was doing in order to do that. Because it felt like I was taking a step back, not forward, right? You have to make sure at every step, they feel like they're moving forward, not backwards. The greatest thing that you guys can do to overcome the money obstacle is to have your, your challenger commit at every paragraph. This is something that I will never go back on. Every, I get my challenger, my prospect committing from the get-go. I want them feeling like they are choosing every step of the conversation as we go and helping. I like to help them feel in control from the moment they start talking to me because I want them to start taking that ownership, right? So what that looks like is asking, ending every paragraph with a question. And that question for me is always, tell me what you think about this. How does this feel to you? Do you feel like this is approachable? Give me your thoughts. Tell me what you're thinking. I make sure they are on the same level and playing field that I am at every single paragraph. So that way, by the end, when we've gone through where they've been, where they are and where they're going, I provide a solution. And then I say, here's the link. Go ahead and look at it. Look at the pricing. Look at all the details. Go through everything. And then tell me what you think. Right? They tell me what they think. Because I've asked them that 50 times already during the whole conversation, right? First, they tell me, tell me where you've been. How did you, how did you get to this point, right? And they'll be like, oh, I'm a binge eater. I've been a chronic, you know, quitter my whole life. I can't ever seem to get on track. And I get their history. And then I'll say, okay, where are we at? What are we looking at? What do we need to fix? And they'll be like, oh, I need to lose 100 pounds. And I need to do this and this and this. I'll be like, okay, so here's where we're going to go. Where do you want to be? And I make that part of it. Once I've got their history, once I've got their present, I make every single comment after that as a we statement moving forward so that they know they're not alone. I'm with you, ride or die. We're going to do this. It's okay. This is fine. It's going to work. I'm going to help you, right? There's a lot of that. How are you feeling? Are you thinking this is the right direction? Are you feeling like this is something that you're liking? I ask those questions constantly in our process because I want to make sure that I know where they're at. That was something that was 
very scary for me as a new coach. I was terrified to ask people what they thought, right? It was almost like I wanted to get it all out before they could say anything, right? So that I could like brace myself for rejection. That's, that's not what we're doing here, right? I struggled the most and I struggle the most when I think about myself more than the person I'm talking to in that moment. You have to remove yourself almost completely in those consultations. It's not about you in that moment. They're not building your business. They're trying to build their life. Like, don't get those two things mixed up because that's dangerous territory. You know what I mean? That's when the intention and feeling salesy and all that stuff you don't want to be is prevalent in your conversation. That's what you're projecting if that's how you're feeling, right? So take yourself completely out of the conversation. When I start talking to people about joining my challenge group or their history, their goals, I'm 1000% present in that person in that moment. I don't, I don't care what my business needs. I don't care what my goals are in that moment. I care about helping that person and finding them the best solution there is possible, right? And because of my vision and my goals and all this stuff going on in the background, I automatically operate around those things being achieved. So I'm not worried about that. I'm concerned with how to help this person in front of me and get them into this system that I've created to help them become successful, structure, accountability, support, right? The, the money obstacle, there's a lot of different things you can say. Um, you can ask them which part are they afraid to invest in. You can ask them, um, one thing I also love to say is, okay, then tell me what you want to do. Put it on them, right? If they don't want to use our solution, this is their problem. So put it on them. So what do you want to do then? You tell me, what's your plan, right? You can say, um, you know, if they, if they really go into detail and they're like, I really can't afford this. I feel like I could maybe do one thing, but not both. That's when you say, let's make a plan. And you as the coach advise them on what's the most important thing for that person in that moment, whether it's Shakeology or bot or whatever, that's your moment to coach them, right? Um, you can also ask them, what, what's scaring you financially about this? Are you afraid that you're going to invest in it and not use it? You can ask them that and see if it's a fear thing or if it's actually a financial thing. There's a lot of ways to work around it. It's just, are you bold enough to connect with people and to be something in their life that they don't have yet? Are you willing to not be an enabler, but somebody that helps them actually grow and achieve and level up beyond where they are, which is what they want? right? You're not here to make them comfortable. I think that that's, that's one thing that I really understand now more than ever is that I wanted to make everyone comfortable. I wanted them to make them happy, but in order to make people happy, you have to make them uncomfortable. <laughs> and I, I didn't, I didn't get that. But once I did, then I was like, okay, I get it. I can see how this works a little bit. Um, one thing I will say, you guys, is that your tone, understanding your tone is going to help you a lot. Um, I'm very direct and very energetic and very transparent, right? Like I'm very confident in my intention because I know my intention. They don't know my intention, but I do. So I have to exude the confidence in that intention. That's, I think, where a lot of people um, also sort of fear is that their intent is going to come off wrong. And by being timid and shy and holding back and enabling people, that's actually what makes you feel less genuine, right? Like being very direct, being transparent, even if you have a soft approach, 
that's okay. Like you can be fluffy, you can be soft, you can be very warm and loving and fuzzy, but still be direct and transparent, right? So understanding your tone is really key for these power hours that you do when you do the inviting to understand how it's going to feel genuine for you to do that. It has to match your tone. So if something's not in your tone, meaning you read something that somebody like says, you can copy and paste or this, whatever, and you look at that and immediately you're like, that does not sound like me, <laughs> right? That's when you reword it and you're like, okay, this is more my tone. That's what you're trying to match. And that will help you. So make sure, I think, in your conversations one-on-one -on -one with people that your tone is very present. It'll help you be more connected to what's going on. It'll help you be more present in the conversation. Um, I would say, you guys, honestly, don't stress so much about the actual words that you're saying. Don't be afraid to overshare or undershare. Like, just be yourself because any conversation can be salvaged if you're willing to call yourself out. If the conversation is getting off track, you can always say, hold on, this like, hold on, this is going in a weird direction. Let's go back to the beginning. You can stop it. Like that's something I had to learn because my conversations were going on for days and days and days and I wasn't getting to the point and I was getting frustrated that I was spending so much time and then realizing it was on someone who wasn't actually interested, right? So I had to learn to get very, uh, what's the word? I don't want to say direct again. I just had to get very to the point. I had to keep the conversation on track and I had to make sure that they were comfortable and uncomfortable at the same time with every step because the more uncomfortable they were becoming, but the more um, responsive they were becoming, I knew it was working because you're uncomfortable when you have to change. You're uncomfortable when you have to face what you've done. You're uncomfortable when someone's calling you out and not allowing you to continue the same BS you've always done. If they say, I can't afford this, do you know how many times you guys I've said, then let me know when you can. So many, so many times. Conversation ender. If you're not willing to invest, bye. There's nothing I can do and you're not going to change. <laughs> straight talk, right? Like stop wasting your time for real. Love people, embrace people, do not enable people. That's, that's the opposite of what we're trying to do here. Um, okay. Fear of burning bridges with friends and family. So with your friends and family, again, your tone is so important. Our tone is generally different with our friends and family. Why? because there's history, there's trust, there's respect. There's a lot of things, there's a relationship there. When you're going into conversations with people you've never met, there's no relationship yet. They're getting to know you from the get-go right there. So it is different. You have to really read the room <laughs> with your friends and family, right? Again, this is all about your personal intention and is this about them or is this about you? That's, it's a really simple check, gut check. Is this about me or is this about them? And until you can sit there and make it a, like, for example, my sister, let's just say your sister wants to, let's say your sister's overweight and you're like, oh, I want to help her because I know she's constantly beating herself up about this. I want to help her feel better. I want to help her see past the weight. I want to help her see the lifestyle. I want to help her see how to take care of herself so she can feel good, right? Like this is what you're thinking. But then when you think about the conversation you're going to have with her, all of a sudden you're like, it's not about that anymore. It's about selling your challenge pack because that's what you need. It's about making her a coach because that's what you need, right? And all of a sudden those lines are blurred and what happens? The intention is gone and the genuine, the authenticity is gone. That's why it doesn't work. So until you can say to yourself, I'm going to approach this in a way that's loving and respectful to her and in a way that is genuine, like I genuinely love you so much and it hurts me to see you hurting. What can I do to help you? 
Why can't we do that? You know what I mean? Like, just think about that for a second. It's hard to think like that when you're not present. So inviting you guys does take practice. You don't gain this kind of patience, presence from the get-go. This comes from years of talking to people. This comes from lots of conversations being burned, right? If you're afraid to burn bridges, let me tell you, you're going to burn bridges. But if you're willing to call yourself out and be like, I'm so sorry, this went in a direction that I wasn't expecting. This is not all what, let's start over. I, there isn't a conversation. I don't think you can salvage if you're willing to do that. There isn't just start over. Um, okay. When someone says, yes, I would like more info. Ooh, hopefully our call doesn't end because somebody else just logged in. Let me just go for two more minutes and then we'll, um, we'll end. When someone says, I'd like more info, I ask about their health and fitness goals. They tell me then instead of continuing to ask questions to really get deep down with them and go move forward, recommending a program. So I feel as though it says stays more surface level. So again, you guys, it's about reading the room. Every person's going to be different. That when someone says, yes, I'd like more information. What I say is, what parts do you want more information on? Are you wanting to lose weight? Are you wanting to fix your nutrition? That's how I ask that question. It's crazy how you have to really think about how can I, because you do think in your mind, like, how can I get this person to tell me where they've been and where they are and what they want? Like, that's what you're trying to get from them, right? So if you can format your questions and responses in that way, how can I respond in a way that's going to give me information about what they're actually wanting information about? Right? And if they're, if they're responding to a, an invite you made about your challenge group and they say, I want more information, say, which part of the, which part of my group are you the most interested in? The nutritional side, the exercising side, what's your goal right now? Do you see how you can kind of manage the conversation a little better when you start like that? You guys, I'm telling you, before you send them anything, you have to get that history. That is the connection. That is your PowerPoint. That is your leverage. That is everything. If you don't have that, you don't have anything. You cannot create a solution for them without that information. So make your conversation and that goal around that. You're my formula, where you've been, where you at, and where are we going? So simple, but it's so powerful. That, those are the three main points, you guys, that people are emotionally charged with in this process, with their health and fitness, their history, and where all of these bad habits and bad mindsets and crap started, right? How they got to where they are and making them face that like for real in order to move forward and then having a strong, confident plan with someone who's on their team, ride or die. Think about how powerful that is. Think about it. You get to be that person and that's amazing. So if there's any tips that I can give you with your conversations, um, you know, they largely gear around that. Take yourself out of it. It's not about you. Make sure that that flow, you have the information first, right? You establish yourself. That's how you establish yourself as a coach in that moment. Give me more information, right? And then honestly, you guys, just understanding your own tone is going to help you. What kind of vibe do you naturally have? I would even say, don't try to create a tone. Like what is your tone? If you try and create it and imitate something that somebody else is doing, it's not going to work. You have to really embrace who you are, your tone, how you operate, the kind of person you are, 
And you're going to attract those kind of people. And those conversations are going to flow so much more naturally because they're going to understand you and your vibe and your energy. And that's what they're going to crave and want. They're going to be attracted to that. And that's what we want. So um, I'm sorry we ran out of a little bit of time. Um, I would love to go through all of this because I think that these conversations are so important, even though we didn't practically get any work done. I think mentally, this really helps you go out and start inviting so much more confidently. Remember that you're the one that is confident in your intention and you have to make them confident in your intention, right? Earn that, earn that trust. Show them transparency and credibility by being yourself. It will shine through over and over and over again. Even if you don't have a great approach, but you're authentic, people will flock to that. You know what I mean? So don't be so afraid to be polished. Just be yourself and create that confident intention in your conversations and go rock it. You guys have, what, five more days of the month? Go find three more people, get them into a conversation and practice some of this stuff that you learned and just see how it goes. And if something that you apply works, tell me, I want to hear about it because I think this stuff is really what is so business and game changing for you. It'll help you so much. Um, okay. Uh, I am going to post the recording. I can post it on my YouTube so that it's just there. So you guys don't have to ask your uplines for it if you don't want. Um, and I'll see you guys not next week is leadership. So I'll be gone next week. I think the following week I have. So I'll see you guys in a couple weeks.